She, wearing the dark lilac dress she had worn during the first days of their married life, and put on again today, a dress particularly remembered and loved by him, was sitting on the she was suing at Brodery Anglings. He thought and wrote, never losing the happy consciousness of her presence. His work, both on the land and on the book, in which the principles of the new land system were to be laid down, had not been abandoned, but just as formerly these pursuits and ideas had seen. He went on with his work, but he felt now that the center of gravity of his attention had passed to something else, and that consequently he looked at his work quite differently and more clearly. Formerly this work had been for him an escape from life. Formerly he had felt that without this work his life would be too gloomy. Now these pursuits were necessary for him that life might not be too uniformly bright. Taking up his manuscript, reading through what he had written, he found with pleasure that the work was worth his working at. Many of his old ideas seemed to him superfluous and extreme, but many blanks became distinct to him when he reviewed the whole thing in his memory. He was writing now a new chapter on the causes of the present disastrous condition of agriculture in Russia. He maintained that the poverty of Russia arises not merely from the anomalous distribution of landed property in misdirected reforms, but that what had contributed of late years to this result was the it see it he a while he was writing his ideas, she was thinking how unnaturally cordial her husband had been to young Prince Charsky, who had, with great want of tact, flirted with her the day before they left my He's jealous, she thought. Goodness, how sweet and silly he is. He's jealous of me. If he knew that I think no more of them than of Pyotr the cook, she thought, looking at his head and red neck with a feeling of possession, though it's a pity to take him from his work but he has plenty of time. I must look at his face. Will he feel I'm looking at him? I wish he'd turn round. I'll will him too. And she opened her eyes wide, as though to intensify the influence of her gaze. Yes, they draw away all the sap and give a false appearance of prosperity. He muttered, stopping to write, and feeling that she was looking at him and smiling. Well, he queried, smiling and getting up. He looked round, she thought. It's nothing. I wanted you to look round, she said, watching him, and trying to guess whether he was vexed at being interrupted or not. How happy we are alone together. I am, that is, he said, going up to her with a radiant smile of happiness. I'm just as happy. I'll never go anywhere, especially not to Moscow. And what were you thinking about? I, I was thinking, no, no, go along, go on writing. Don't break off, she said, pursing up her lips. And I must cut out these little holes now, do you see? She took up her scissors and began cutting them. No, tell me, what was it, he said, sitting down beside her and watching the tiny scissors moving round. Oh, what was I thinking about? I was thinking about Moscow about the back of your head. Why should I, of all people, have such happiness? It's, I feel quite the opposite. The better things are, the more natural it seems to me. And you've got a little curl loose, he said, carefully turning her head round. A little curl, oh yes. No, no, we are busy at our work. Work did not progress further and they darted apart from one another like culprits when Cosma came in to announce that tea was ready. Have they come from the town? Levin asked Cosma. They've just come. They re-unpacking the things. Come quickly, she said to him as she went out of the study, or else I shall read your letters without you left alone after. Levin smiled at his own thoughts and shook his head disapprovingly at those thoughts. A feeling akin to remorse fretted him. There was something shameful, effeminate Kaplan, as he called it to himself, in his present mode of life. It's not right to go on like this, he thought. It'll soon be three months, and I'm doing next to nothing. Today, almost for the first time, 
I set to work seriously, and what happened? I did nothing but begin and throw it aside. Even my ordinary pursuits I have almost given up. On the land I scarcely walk or drive about at all to look after things. Either I am loath to leave her, or I see she's dull alone. And I used to think that, before marriage, life was nothing much, somehow didn't count, but that after marriage, life began in earnest. And here almost three months have passed, and I have spent my time so idly and unprofitably. No, this won't do. I must begin. Of course, it's not her fault. She's not to blame in any way. I ought myself to be firmer, to maintain my masculine independence of action. Or else I shall get into such ways, and she'll get used to them too. Of course she's not to blame, he told himself. But it is hard for anyone who is dissatisfied not to blame someone else, and especially the person nearest of all to him, for the ground of his dissatisfaction. And it vaguely came into Levin's mind that she herself was not to blame, she could not be to blame for anything, but what was to blame was her education, too superficial and frivolous. That fool Charsky, she wanted, I know, to stop him, but didn't know how to, yes, apart from her interest in the house, that she has, apart from dress and no interest in her work, in the estate, in the peasants, nor in music, though she's rather good at it, nor in reading. She does nothing and is perfectly satisfied. Levin, in his heart, censured this, and did not as yet understand that she was preparing for that period of activity which was to come. He knew not that she was instinctively aware of this, and preparing herself for this time of terrible toil, did not reproach herself for the moments of carelessness and happiness in her love that... Chapter 16 When Levin went upstairs his wife was sitting near the new silver samover behind the new tea service, and having settled old Agafia Mahalovna at a little table with a f You see, your good lady settled me here, told me to sit a bit with her, said Agafia Mahalovna, smiling affectionately at Kitty. In these words of Agafia Mahalovna, Levin read the final act of the drama which had been enacted of late between her and Kitty. He saw that, in spite of Agafia Mahalovna's feelings being hurt by a new mistress taking the reins of government out of her hands, Kitty had yet conquered her and made her love her. Here, I opened your letter too, said Kitty, handing him an illiterate letter. It's from that woman, I think, your brother's, she said. I did not read it through. This is from my people and from Dolly. Fancy, Dolly took Tenia and Grisha to a children's ball at the Sarmatskys. Tenny was a French Marquise, but Levin did not hear her. Flushing, he took the letter from Maria Nikolaevna, his brother's former mistress, and began to read it. This was the second letter he had received from Maria Nikolaevna. In the first letter, Maria Nikolaevna wrote that his brother had sent her away for no fault of hers, and with touching simplicity added that though she was in want again, she asked, now she wrote quite differently. She had found Nikolay Dmitrievich, had again made it up with him in Moscow, and had moved with him to a provincial town, where he had received a post in the government service, but that he had quarreled with the head official, and was on his way back to Moscow, only he had been taken so ill on the road that it was doubtful if he would ever leave his bed again, she wrote, it's always of you he has talked, and, besides, he has no more money left. Read this. Dolly writes about you, Kitty was beginning, with a smile. What is it, what's the matter? She writes to me that Nicolay, my brother, is at death's door. I shall go to him. Kitty's face changed at once. Thoughts of Tenia as a Marquise of Dolly, all had vanished. When are you going? She said. Tomorrow, and I will go with you, can I, she said. Kitty, what are you thinking of? He said reproachfully. How do you mean? Offended that he should seem to take her suggestion unwillingly and with vexation. Why shouldn't I go? I shan't be in your way. I, I'm going because my brother is dying, said Levin. Why should you, why, for the same reason as you? 
and, at a moment of such gravity for me, she only thinks of her being dull by herself. Thought Levin, and this lack of candor in a matter of such gravity infuriated him. It's out of the question, he said sternly. Agafia Mihailovna, seeing that it was coming to a quarrel, gently put down her cup and withdrew. Kitty did not even notice her. The tone in which her husband had said the last words wounded her, especially because he evidently did not believe what she had said. I tell you that if you go, I shall come with you. I shall certainly come, she said hastily and wrathfully. Why out of the question? Why do you say it's out of the question? Because it'll be going God knows where, by all sorts of roads and to all sorts of hotels. You would be a hindrance to me, said Levin, trying to be cool. Not at all. I don't want anything. Where you can go, I can. Well, for one thing then, because this woman's there whom you can't meet. I don't know and don't care to know who's there and what. I know that my husband's brother is dying and my husband is going to him. And I go with my husband too. Kitty, don't get angry. But just think a little. This is a matter of such importance that I can't bear to think that you should bring in a feeling of weakness, of dislike, to being left alone. Come, you will be dull alone, so go and stay at Moscow a little. There you always ascribe base, vile motives to me, she said with tears of wounded pride and fear. I didn't mean. It wasn't weakness. It wasn't. I feel that it's my duty to be with my husband when he's in trouble, but you try on purpose to hurt me, you try on purpose not to understand. No, this is awful. To be such a slave, cried Levin. But at the same second he felt that he was beating himself. Then why did you marry? You could have been free. Why did you, if you regret it, she said, getting up and running away into the drawing room. When he went to her, she was sobbing. He began to speak trying to find words not to dissuade but simply to soothe her. But she did not heed him, and would not agree to anything. He bent down to her and took her hand, which resisted him. He kissed her hand, kissed her hair, kissed her hand again, still she was silent. But when he took her face in both his hands and said Kitty, she suddenly recovered herself, and began to cry, and they were reconciled. It was decided that they should go together the next day. Levin told his wife that he believed she wanted to go simply in order to be of use, agreed that Maria Nikolaevna's being with his brother did not make her going improper, but he set off at the bottom of his... He was dissatisfied with her for being unable to make up her mind to let him go when it was necessary, and how strange it was for him to think that he so lately hardly daring to believe in such happiness as that she... Even greater was the feeling of disagreement at the bottom of his heart as to her not needing to consider the woman who was with his brother, and he thought with horror of all the contingencies they might meet with. The mere idea of his wife, his kitty, being in the same room with a common wench, set him shuddering with horror and loathing. Chapter 17 The hotel of the provincial town where Nikolay Levin was lying ill was one of those provincial hotels which are constructed on the newest model of modern improvements, with the best intention. This hotel had already reached that stage, and the soldier in a filthy uniform smoking in the entry, supposed to stand for a hall porter, and the cast iron, slippery, as is invariably the case. After they had been asked at what price they wanted rooms, it appeared that there was not one decent room for them. One decent room had been taken by... There remained only one filthy room, next to which they promised that another should be empty by the evening. Feeling angry with his wife because what he had expected had come to pass, which was that at the moment of arrival, when his heart throbbed with emotion and anxiety to know how his brother was getting on, go, do go, she said, looking at him with timid and guilty eyes. He went out of the door without a word, and at once stumbled over Maria Nikolaevna, who had heard of his arrival and had not dared to go in to see him. She was just the same as when he saw her in Moscow. The same woolen gown and bare arms and neck, and the same good-naturedly stupid, pockmarked face, only a little plumper. Well, how is he, how is he, very bad. He can't get up. He has kept expecting you. He? 
Are you? Are you? With your wife. Levin did not for the first moment understand what it was confused her, but she immediately enlightened him. I'll go away. I'll go down to the kitchen, she brought out. Nikolay Dmitrievich will be delighted. He heard about it and knows your lady and remembers her abroad. Levin realized that she meant his wife and did not know what answer to make. Come along, come along to him, he said. But as soon as he moved, the door of his room opened and Kitty peeped out. Levin crimsoned both from shame and anger with his wife, who had put herself and him in such a difficult position, but Maria Nikolaevna crimsoned still more. She positively shrank together and flushed to the point of tears, and clutching the ends of her apron in both hands, twisted them in her red fingers without knowing what to say and what to do. For the first instant Levin saw an expression of eager curiosity in the eyes with which Kitty looked at this awful woman, so incomprehensible to her. But it lasted only a single instant. Well, how is he? She turned to her husband and then to her. But one can't go on talking in the passage like this, Levin said, looking angrily at a gentleman who walked jauntily at that instant across the corridor, as though about his affairs. Well then, come in, said Kitty, turning to Maria Nikolaevna, who had recovered herself, but noticing her husband's face of dismay or go on. And then Levin went to his brother's room. He had not in the least expected what he saw and felt in his brother's room. He had expected to find him in the same state of self-deception which he had heard was so frequent with the consumptive, and which had struck him so much during his brother's visit in the autumn. He had expected to find the physical signs of the approach of death more marked greater weakness, greater emaciation, but still almost the same condition of things. He had expected himself to feel the same distress at the loss of the brother he loved and the same horror in face of death as he had felt then, only in a greater degree. And he had prepared himself for this, but he found something utterly different. In a little dirty room, with the painted panels of its walls filthy with spittle, and conversation audible through the thin partition from the next room, in a stifling atmosphere saturated with impurity, one arm of this body was above the quilt, and the wrist, huge as a rake handle, was attached, inconceivably it seemed, to the thin, long bone of the arm smooth, the head lay sideways on the pillow. Levin could see the scanty locks wet with sweet on the temples and tense, transparent-looking forehead. It cannot be that that fearful body was my brother Nikolay, thought Levin. But he went closer, saw the face, and doubt became impossible. In spite of the terrible change in the face, Levin had only to glance at those eager eyes raised at his approach, only to catch the faint movement of the mouth under the sticky mustache, to read the glittering eyes looked sternly and reproachfully at his brother as he drew near. And immediately this glance established a living relationship between living men. Levin immediately felt the reproach in the eyes fixed on him and felt remorse at his own happiness. When Constantin took him by the hand, Nikolay smiled. The smile was faint, scarcely perceptible, and in spite of the smile the stern expression of the eyes was unchanged. You did not expect to find me like this, he articulated with effort. Yes, no, said Levin, hesitating over his words. How was it you didn't let me know before? That is, at the time of my wedding I made inquiries in all directions. He had to talk so as not to be silent, and he did not know what to say. Levin told his brother that his wife had come with him. Nikolay expressed pleasure but said he was afraid of frightening her by his condition. A silence followed. Suddenly Nikolay stirred and began to say something. Levin expected something of peculiar gravity and importance from the expression of his face, but Nikolay began speaking of his health. He found fault with the doctor, regretting he had not a celebrated Moscow doctor. Levin saw that he still hoped. Seizing the first moment of silence, Levin got up, anxious to escape, if only for an instant, from his agonizing emotion, 
and said that he would go and fetch his wife. Very well, and I'll tell her to tidy up here. It's dirty and stinking here, I expect. Maria, clear up the room, the sick man said with effort. Oh, and when you've cleared up, go away yourself, he added, looking inquiringly at his brother. Levin made no answer. Going out into the corridor, he stopped short. He had said he would fetch his wife, but now, taking stock of the emotion he was feeling, he decided that he would try on the contrary to persuade her not to go into the sick man. Why should she suffer as I am suffering? He thought. Well, how is he? Kitty asked with a frightened face. Oh, it's awful, it's awful. What did you come for? said Levin. Kitty was silent for a few seconds, looking timidly and ruefully at her husband. Then she went up and took him by the elbow with both hands. Kostia, take me to him. It will be easier for us to bear it together. You only take me, take me to him, please, and go away, she said. You must understand that for me to see you, and not to see him, is far more painful. There I might be a help to you and to him. Please, let me, she besought her husband, as though the happiness of her life depended on it. Levin was obliged to agree, and regaining his composure, and completely forgetting about Maria Nikolaevna by now, he went again into his brother with Kitty, stepping lightly, and continually glancing at her husband, showing him a valorous and sympathetic face, Kitty went into the sick room, and, turning without haste, noise, with inaudible steps she went quickly to the sick man's bedside, and going up so that he had not to turn his head, she immediately clasped in her fresh young hand the skeleton of his huge hand. We have met, though we were not acquainted at sudden, she said. You never thought I was to be your sister. You would not have recognized me, he said, with a radiant smile at her entrance. Yes, I should. What a good thing you let us know. Not a day has passed that Kostia has not mentioned you, and been anxious. But the sick man's interest did not last long. Before she had finished speaking, there had come back into his face the stern, reproachful expression of the dying man's envy of the living. I am afraid you are not quite comfortable here, she said, turning away from his fixed stare and looking about the room. We must ask about another room, she said to her husband, so that we might be nearer. Chapter 18 Levin could not look calmly at his brother. He could not himself be natural. When he went into the sick man, his eyes and his attention were unconsciously dimmed, and he did not see and did not distinguish the details of his brother's position. He smelt the awful odor, saw the dirt disorder and miserable condition, and heard the groans, and felt that nothing could be done to help. It never entered his head to analyze the details of the sick man's situation, to consider how that body was lying under the quilt, how those emaciated legs and thighs and spine were lying huddled. It made his blood run cold when he began to think of all these details. He was absolutely convinced that nothing could be done to prolong his brother's life or to relieve his suffering. But a sense of his regarding all aid as out of the question was felt by the sick man, and exasperated him, and this made it still more painful for Levin. To be in the sick room was agony to him, not to be there still worse, and he was continually, on various pretexts, going out of the room, and coming in again because he was unable to remain alone. But Kitty thought, and felt, and acted quite differently. On seeing the sick man, she pitied him and pity in her womanly heart did not arouse at all that feeling of horror and loathing that it aroused in her husband, but a desire to act, to find out all the details of his state, and, and since she had not the slightest doubt that it was her duty to help him, she had no doubt either that it was possible, and immediately set to work. The very details, the mere thought of which reduced her husband to terror, immediately engaged her attention. She sent for the doctor, sent to the chemists, set the maid who had come with her and Maria Nikolaevna to sweep and dust and scrub. She herself washed up something, washed out something else. Something was by her directions brought into the sick room, 
something else was carried out. She herself went several times to her room, regardless of the men she met in the corridor, got out and brought in sheets, pillowcases, towels, and shirts. The waiter, who was busy with a party of engineers dining in the dining hall, came several times with an irate countenance in answer to her summons, and could not avoid carrying out her orders. Levin did not approve of all this. He did not believe it would be of any good to the patient. Above all, he feared the patient would be angry at it. But the sick man, though he seemed and was indifferent about it, was not angry but only abashed, and on the whole, as it were, interested in what she was doing with him. Coming back from the doctor to whom Kitty had sent him, Levin, on opening the door, came upon the sick man at the instant when, by Kitty's directions, they were changing his linen. The long white ridge of his spine, with the huge, prominent shoulder blades and jutting ribs and vertebra, was bare, and Maria Nikolaevna and the waiter were struggling with the sleeve of Kitty, hurriedly closing the door after Levin, was not looking that way, but the sick man groaned, and she moved rapidly towards him. Make haste, she said. Oh, don't you come, said the sick man angrily. I'll do it by myself. What say? queried Maria Nikolaevna. But Kitty heard and saw he was ashamed and uncomfortable at being naked before her. I'm not looking. I'm not looking, she said, putting the arm in. Maria Nikolaevna, you come this side, you do it, she added. Please go for me. There's a little bottle in my small bag, she said, turning to her husband. You know, in the side pocket. Bring it, please, and meanwhile they'll. The heavy smell was replaced by the smell of aromatic vinegar, which Kitty, with pouting lips and puffed out, rosy cheeks, was squirting through a little pipe. There was no dust visible anywhere. A rug was laid by the bedside. On the table stood medicine bottles and decanters tiddly arranged, and the linen needed was folded up there and Kitty's broderie anglaise. On the other table by the patient's bed there were candles and drink and powders. The sick man himself, washed and calmed, lay in clean sheets on high raised pillows, in a clean night shirt with a white collar about his astoundingly thin neck, and with a new ex the doctor brought by Levin, and found by him at the club, was not the one who had been attending Nikolay Levin, as the patient was dissatisfied with him. The new doctor took up a stethoscope and sounded the patient, shook his head, prescribed medicine, and with extreme minuteness explained first how to take the medicine and then what diet. He advised eggs, raw or hardly cooked, and seltzer water, with warm milk at a certain temperature. When the doctor had gone away the sick man said something to his brother, of which Levin could distinguish only the last words, your Katia. By the expression with which he gazed at her, he called indeed to Katia, as he called her. I'm much better already, he said. Why, with you I should have got well long ago. How nice it is. He took her hand and drew it towards his lips, but as though afraid she would dislike it, he changed his mind, let it go, and only stroked it. Kitty took his hand in both hers and pressed it. Now turn me over on the left side and go to bed, he said. No one could make out what he said but Kitty. She alone understood. She understood because she was all the while mentally keeping watch on what he needed. On the other side, she said to her husband, he always sleeps on that side. Turn him over, it's so disagreeable calling the servants. I'm not strong enough. Can you? She said to Maria Nikolaevna. I'm afraid not, answered Maria Nikolaevna. Terrible as it was to Levin to put his arms round that terrible body, to take hold of that under the quilt, of which he preferred to know nothing, under his wife's influence. While he was turning him over, conscious of the huge emaciated arm about his neck, Kitty swiftly and noiselessly turned the pillow, beat it up and settled in at the sick man's head. The sick man kept his brother's hand in his own. Levin felt that he meant to do something with his hand and was pulling it somewhere. Levin yielded with a sinking heart. Yes. He drew it to his mouth and kissed it. Levin, shaking with sobs and unable to articulate a word, 
went out of the room. Chapter 19 Thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. So Levin thought about his wife as he talked to her that evening. Levin thought of the text, not because he considered himself wise and prudent. He did not so consider himself, but he could not help knowing that he had more intellect than his wife and a gay female.